you guys for being here today. I, I think that some of us just walked in the room, so I know it's very transition <laughs> from walking into the room to suddenly being on stage. So thank you for moving quickly. Um, so, so why don't we start out by not talking specific bank and just framing sort of mobile wallets as, as, as a general thing uh, and asking the question, what do each of you believe it ultimately takes for a mobile wallet to be successful? Oh, all right. Good question to <laughs> put everybody on spot, right? Is uh, not much of uh, mobile banking wallets have been successful. Well, a couple of things, very uh, easy to say, very difficult to do. Um, it's got to be better than uh, plastic, um, at least as easy as plastic. So basically, um, as easy as plastic, meaning, you know, it's got to have acceptance everywhere or at least majority of places. So you can't just search we accept my card, you know, we accept my mobile payment. So that's why we need to see more contactless POSs, right? Um, and then if you want um, to replace something, you need to be at least as good and preferably better than the one that you're trying to replace. So it's got to have features that the plastic don't have. Um, it's uh, since plastic obviously is just one item and then digital wallets have screens and mobility and connections. So you got to have card controls on it. You got to have real time notifications. You got to have rewards. So all the things that you believe you could and you wanted to bring into plastic and acceptance and payments and shopping moments, um, but that you had difficulty because of lack of that particular ecosystem, you could actually do with mobile payments. So. Again, um, acceptance, uh, ubiquity uh, for uh, um, contactless, and then a lot of features that will make the consumer's life easier. So good luck, guys. I don't know what's left <laughs> other than that list of stuff. But right. any, any additional things or point of view? I think, I think those are the core things. Um, and when you speak to differentiation from existing methods, uh, I think the, really the only people in the United States who have done a good job of that have been merchants. right? If you look at Target or if you look at Starbucks, adding super premium rewards in the case of, well, I, I think you could argue both of them, but also increased convenience in terms of speedy pickup or, or sort of uh, options for new products. So, yeah, no, I think that was quite exhaustive, um, but, but I'll, I'll put a slightly different framework around it. Um, prior to Accenture, I was at Capital One, I was at ISIS, Slash soft card. I oh, love saying I was, ISIS. <laughs> I was senior vice president of ISIS. Um, <laughs> doesn't look good on resume, right? Doesn't look good on resume. Thank, 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 thank Mike Abbott for changing the name. Um, so putting that in a slightly different framework, I think of it from a product standpoint. Products have to fulfill a need. They have to serve a purpose and solve a problem for customers. And then they have to do that in a manner that is both habit forming for me as the, as, as the issuer or the mobile wallet provider and drive habit. And that's all through experience. So when you talk about building product, let's take mobile wallet out of the equation. When you talk about building product, you first start with the consumer and you say, what am I trying to solve? And then what are their needs across a digital journey? And if you start there, you get to some of the features that you spoke about. Um, and not to you know, take this too far out to the end of, of the presentation, but you look at the spectrum of wallets. You know, If you have Starbucks as the st gold star of merchant wallets all the way through to, you know, I, I don't want to name anybody on the other end, but very functional payment mechanisms you see that spectrum very well laid out and you could probably break those down in the form of that type of uh, digital journey. So let, let's talk about some of those different types of wallets because one of the interesting things when looking across the world is different market dynamics that drive the types of wallets that are successful. Um, you spend much time looking at China and Asia, you see the WeChat and, WeChat and Alipay model. Um, in the US, there are entities that could play those roles and even in some cases have tried in the past and not quite gotten there, right? Like Facebook has done payments within the Facebook app for years, but no one uses it. Google does peer-to-peer -peer payments in Gmail, but no one uses it, right? So do you believe the specifically the US consumer, do they want the aggregated wallet experience, the, the app, the super app that has everything in it? 
or do they want single purpose apps? Do they want the Starbucks app and the Dunkin' app and the Subway app as opposed to the Salt Card app or the ISIS app? Um, I, I spent some time on that too, and I think it's, it's hard just to not call it ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that part of the problem, right? Is they don't want the aggregated experience, they want a single app per use case or per, per interaction. Happy to give our perspective on it. Um, we, several years ago, came to the conclusion that uh, so we, we've done a lot of primary research on this. We've looked at uh, all the secondary research we can get our hands on. And when you, you, you combine those with what you see in the market, like uh, overwhelmingly, the consumer wants uh, what, you know, what you can call a, a super app, right? They want a consolidated place to do their business. I don't think anyone in the United States has delivered on it. I think the, the best examples really have been in Asia. Uh, certainly, to Scott's point, there are people who are equipped to do it, and for whatever reason, and we can speculate on on some of those, they haven't chosen to emphasize it at least quite yet. So I will see your research, and I'll raise your research. <laughs> I, no, I completely agree with you. Um, uh, but but expanding out on that, um, I think the payment industry has co-opted the term wallet. And they have made it their own, and it's synonymous. When we talk about it, it's synonymous with payment. And to your point, other apps, those super apps, are not. They're synonymous with utility, mm -hmm. with, you know, my wallet is the thing I carry lots of stuff in. And each of those things has a tentacle into my life. It has a usefulness into my day-to-day -day transactions, whether it be insurance, my driver's license, et cetera. So I agree, and the research that we had done uh, early on in my time in Capital One was I want something that helps me fulfill the digital version of my wallet, and payment was sixth. And that's a very sobering point of view mm -hmm. for all these companies who want to be top of file, top of, of, of digital wallet. All right, well, I... So you are a researcher. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to up it. I don't agree with that. Um, research, obviously, the findings, you cannot agree. That, that's something else. But uh, no, I think the, the, the research, obviously, when you ask people, you get a lot of uh, you know, um, feedback. Um, but when it comes to real-world experience, consumers sometimes behave differently than they answer to certain questions. Um, so to me, um, if you use the word wallet, the first thing that comes to anybody's mind is ability to pay. Because a wallet carries obviously your ID, blah, blah, but you also uh, associate those other documents like your driving license or national ID, whatever you have, with some other you know, entities. So wallet needs to first and foremost help, should help you to pay with it. That, that's my belief. And therefore, although, yes, I think consumers would like to have an aggregated super wallet, um, it should definitely have a payment functionality in it. If it doesn't have that, um, for instance, take Apple uh, Wallet. Um, it's been on your telephone for a long time, but probably the first time you start using it was with Apple Pay. And now probably we're going to see more usage of it with Apple Card. So, I mean, yes, you might want to add a lot of functionalities in terms of other um, uh, plastic in your wallet, other uh, piece of paper in your wallet, but it needs to provide payment at the time that you need as a consumer, um, as easy as and as uh, you know, simple as, as your plastic. So you might end up adding a lot of functionality and, and end up with a super wallet, but you need to start from the very basic, which is payment. So just to add another data point, I won't, I won't play up the theme of one-upping research again, but um, through, through some work I've done with UNC Charlotte, a uh, university that's done some research on this topic, specifically looking at different cultures around the world and how the cultural preferences have driven some of this behavior in digital wallets, one of the, the findings in that was 
Um, I'll, I'll use some generic, some general terms here just for the sake of, of making the argument. But the research found that in a lot of Asian cultures, especially in China, the culture is very much driven by not desiring a multitude of choice. There's some degree of wanting to be told what the answer is and or options are or narrowing it down, right? I mean, a lot of that you can imagine how in society like China, how that's been driven into the culture. And the U.S. is quite the opposite, right? If you want a choice about everything. You want to know, you know, 32 flavors of ice cream. You want to know, you know, talking about shoes, like it's not just the shoes, it's there's 15 colors of those shoes. It's all about choice. And that part of the way that comes through in this particular topic is that the American consumer is not okay with a app because that's one answer. They, they want to make choices for every use case. So I, I think... I think we're splitting hairs because, again, we put our construct on customer experience. So you're saying in that research that an app is a container, and within that container, I have everything. But everything is a feature. It's a tap. It's a swipe. It are, there are all these things that I can do within that app. Now, break that construct apart and think about the device. It's no different. You may have gone into the app, but that's just your orientation. If my orientation is the device, then it's no different. I have no additional work that I have to do to get to those choices. And again, I don't, I, I don't mean to be a broken record, but I think it really comes back to what am I trying to achieve in terms of my customer experience, my customer choice, what is the problem I'm solving? There are a lot of um, uh, issuers that have multiple apps for different uh, for different uses. Um, Facebook split apart Messenger and Facebook very very consciously. Uh, has it been a huge success or a huge failure? I don't think it would depend on whether it was one or two apps. I think it has to do with the functionality. So let's talk a little bit about that, the concept of a merchant app versus a bank app, just in terms of what value it is providing or what, what the product set really is. Um, you know, I, I think on the merchant side, it's easy to see some of the, the key use cases that are driving adoption there, right? You think of ordering ahead, pure convenience, right? Uh, you think of loyalty, again, a, a managed program where it's easy. What other factors, maybe other than those two, do, we, do you feel like are attributing to the success we're seeing with merchant or retailer wallets? Well, um, we talk about Starbucks app, but then, you know, can you name many other apps? Um, you mentioned Starbucks because almost everybody goes there almost, not every day perhaps, but uh, if not every day, a couple of times a week, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's difficult to find, um, even buying gasoline, you don't go every day. Um, buying groceries, you don't go every day, although those two are the uh, biggest uh, merchant category codes in, in, in credit cards. Um, so uh, remember the old days where we used to carry all these co-branded cards, right? And uh, many people still do. A card for gasoline, card for um, keeping track of your points in somewhere. So uh, eventually, I think technology should help us to, to move away from that and, and help those merchants to come together with some other complementary merchants and hopefully with banks to create a very simple payment and, and shopping and, and points environment. But we've tried that, right? We um, tried it in ISIS, we tried it in, in MCX, we've tried it a number of times, well, we tried it with Plenty. Good, good examples. Now, I think uh, I can tell you another example, which is uh, about to getting um, you know uh, shut down, is Chase Pay. So a lot of things you, you believe technology can do, and, and ISIS could do that, of course, MCX could do that. But I'm not talking about the big coalition in the beginning. I'm talking about even a single entity like uh, Fifth Third um, or, you know, take Chase, Chase Pay. For Chase Pay to be successful, there must have been an entity called Chase Payments, which oversaw issuing and acquiring at the same time. So the ONAS would come 
as a customer requirement to create a better shopping experience, not to have a technology experience. So you need to have business models and therefore uh, organizational models to drive those successes. What is different in, uh, uh, in, in the US than many other markets, the fragmentation. Issuing and acquiring don't speak with, other, with one another. Technology companies don't work well with the banks. So, um, but even within the same bank, um, there are a lot of uh, examples outside of U.S. where banks and retailers could, put, could uh, come together and put together a successful um, plastic and then wallet examples. Not like China where everything is together, but in between. <laughs> in between. So, that, I mean, it, you can do those. I believe that U.S. banks can still do those if they decide to change a little bit their business model, which is a question mark, of course. Before I pick on Chase Pay specifically, any other opinions <laughs> on that? So, so the question was, why have merchant wallets seen adoption? Sure. I, I think it comes back to uh, really what Matt was saying. They're, they're solving customer jobs, right? Like the jobs that, uh, that the customers need to do, they're, they're solving. They're providing convenience, right? They are, and I think... Uh, when you look at the the sort of spectrum of features they're providing, the the convenience and the efficiency and sort of the value they provide in that area is far greater than the five percent cash back you get at Target. I mean that's that's important certainly, but you know being able to, I, I, you would use the Starbucks app just to get your 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 coffee faster, even if there were no rewards associated with it. Yeah, it, I'll I'll just keep that going. Utility. There's also community. There's a brand um, loyalty, a brand uh, uh, halo to uh, uh, whether it's it's you know I can think of Dunkin', Starbucks, Walmart. Um, Walmart Pay has had uh, tough penetration, but if you look at all of the capabilities of the app, and you know some of the others where you can get your uh, 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 pay ahead, order ahead, you can get your coupons integrated. Softcard had a beautiful part uh, in, <laughs> in, in uh, enabling that. Um, all of these things are terrific, but you know, if the bank, if your bank had that, would you feel the loyalty on uh, around that brand? Would you feel the community that made you choose that over some other app? Yeah, so let's pivot to that, right? So if we say for for <laughs> retailer wallets, there's a clearly defined set of value that's being added there, right? Again, whether it's convenience or loyalty or, or all the things you guys said, how do you map that over to, to issuer wallets? What 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 is the job to be done for an issuer wallet? What is the problem that it's solving for a customer or the, the reason for it to exist, if you will? I don't think there is a good reason for it to exist. Which is why none of them really do. Uh, counter uh, counter yeah. opinion? Yeah, counter opinion, definitely. <laughs> um, so, because I did build uh, wallets successfully, and um, uh, but it takes a lot. Um, so we're talking about the U.S. market, which is much more to crack, much more difficult to crack. But um, so coming back to banking, and take a wallet outside of payments, and let me give you an example about convenience like Starbucks. Let's suppose I have a fifth third bank wallet and. Um, I go to a branch, and there are like 10 people, and I get a number. Um, how do I get a number? You know, you basically pull from a little, little machine with a number. But there are cases in, in, in many other markets where you actually uh, have your wallet banking app uh, contactlessly read by a, a reader, and based on your segmentation, gives a number that will put you in front of many others who are just waiting there to do transactions. So if I am a you know, classical example, platinum card holder, or if I'm a guy with a personal financial assets of more than, I don't know, $50,000, $100,000, then I will be the first one next, next up. So even in convenience, in banking, you can do a lot of things if you put, again, the customer at the center. But again, the uh, the organizational structure is very different. So for that to happen, the mobile banking guys, the payment guys, and acquiring guys need to sit, sit together, which don't happen in the US. Um, but coming back to more solidly to your question, um, a wallet for the issuer side can only be successful if it replaces the plastic in a much better ways. So card controls, 
um, all the statements, um, due date changes, um, PIN changes if possible with the debit card, um, international on and off, customer disputes. So take all the things that you will need to spend time on as a customer on call center and put them everything on the wallet. Then add the payment function, which is contactless. Then add the loyalty that you work with your retailers plus with the banking. If you can put all those together, and that's why you probably say most likely those will not be together, <laughs> um, then it's, it's gonna be a success. But if you can't put all these components together by just having a card picture on a bank wallet, you're right, then it's not gonna be a success. You bring up a really good point, which is the, the messiness of the ecosystem <clears throat> and the difficulty to align merchants, issuers, technology partners around a single implementation. I mean, look at um, uh, uh, MasterPass and uh, uh, Visa Checkout. Visa Checkout, yeah. I mean, the difficulty of getting merchants onboarded these guys are incented on stability. They're incented on making sure that the POS works every single time, not necessarily on being the most innovative. And so that is, you, you hit the nail on the head in, uh, in, in one of the main difficulties of getting any adoption uh, across the board. Yeah. So I guess what I would poke at is, I, I buy all of what you said other than the payment. Okay. Right. So sure. Card controls. Great bank feature. Yeah. Uh, check in at branches. Great bank feature. Everything you said. But payment. Right. Like what what is the value of a payment function specifically in a mobile bank context or in a, a oh, mobile? The young people don't want to carry anything outside of telephones. So I can use Apple Pay for that. I can use Android Pay sure. for that. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's. Again, um, U.S. is one country where banks willingly accept it to pay 15 cents per transaction to Apple, and it doesn't happen very often in other markets. So um, if I were a U.S. bank, I would definitely take Apple to court <laughs> to open their NFC to the bank. So yes, Apple Pay could and should be an option. But if I'm a bank who is willing to invest on my own wallet, then I should be having the access to that uh, NFC antenna. Um, but also, um, half of the U.S. population use Android telephones. So Apple Pay is good only to the half of the population, not to the 100% uh, of the population. And eventually, I believe that Apple and banks will come to senses to open NFC to different applications. But even without that Apple Pay, yes, fine. Then as a bank, you can have access to your you know, to Apple Pay uh, for your card and use that as a contactless payment. That's, that's what I meant. I mean, with or without Apple Pay. Um, so, so I'll poke on that theme a little bit. So, uh, you know, let's take the Android side of things where things are open, right? You could build a, a bank app today, include payment at point of sale using contactless, using the Android API layer. Is that of any appeal to a fifth third? Like it is, is a, so the ability is there from a technical standpoint, right? You could have in the fifth third app today, you could do contactless payments. Does that appeal in any way? Is there value added in that that you see from a, something to provide from your customer's perspective? There's definitely value there, right? Anytime when you can increase transactions flowing through your institution, right? I mean, it, it goes straight to your top line. However, the, the effort required to build something like that and get adoption uh, just doesn't, doesn't equate to, to, I think, what we'd get out of it. And Based on what we've seen, the market has moved so far away from banks as the mobile wallet of choice that I, I think it's a, a futile effort. Like uh, to to my colleague's point up here, like it it definitely could be done. I just people have tried. Uh, people far larger with far greater market share than us have tried and not succeeded. And so it's definitely possible. It's just not uh, like we we see far more opportunity in other spaces. So let's talk about Chase Bay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. for those of you who haven't seen it, yeah. Chase uh, now classic they, they were shutting down the mobile app of Chase Bay. And just to be clear, especially if there's any Chase people in the room, my understanding is it's not Chase Pay the product, it's Chase Pay the mobile app specifically. Um, Chase Pay the product lives on lives on as a checkout mechanism for e-commerce um, as well as some back-end partnerships they have. But to me, that that was sort of another uh, reconfirmation of the or confirmation of the voice of 
issuer wallets don't work, right? Doesn't mean issuers can't add functionality to checkout. Doesn't mean that a, a bank like Chase and their model of, as you said, you know, they, they own the acquiring relationship. They own the pipe, essentially. They own the end consumer. They are really the only one that owns all three of those pieces. And so the logic of Chase Pay makes a lot of sense. But but what do you what do you make of the shutdown? Is it people reading too much into it? Is it just you know you try things, some work, some don't, um, or is there a bigger underlying theme there of of why the Chase Pay app specifically uh, didn't work? No, I mean I'll I'll jump in. Uh, I know I know quite a few people who've worked on that app. They're all incredibly smart. Mm -hmm. They know the business better than anyone. Um, but it's it goes back to. They're not solving a problem that isn't already solved for the consumer, especially using a QR code. Mm -hmm. And the mechanism, the ease of use, the benefit uh, to the customer isn't necessarily overwhelmingly convincing to use that over, especially on the Android side, um, uh, uh, what is magnetic uh, uh, stripe emulation. Um, Samsung Pay, yeah. uh, 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 Google Pay now, it's Google Pay, yeah. um, keep names. changing the names, uh, or Apple. And so it's, it's very tough to say, and again, it goes back to, we keep saying wallet. It's not, it's payment. It's not a wallet. It's a payment mechanism. And if that is my only benefit, and I'm not getting enough value on card linked offers or discounts or some other capability, boy, that is tough to drive habit. Exactly. And yeah. habit is what they want. Yeah. That's the only reason you can cost justify the expense. Yeah. Um, I will add to that um, very good uh, points. Um, so Chase, for instance, if anybody uses Chase uh, app, not pay, Chase banking app, it introduced uh, cardling offers yep. to its banking app. So um, again, that's something that was uh, missing in Chase Pay app, um, that in order to replace something, in order to change a habit, you need to invite people for benefits that are not there before, right? So they didn't do that. It was just basically doing something that some other technology companies, as you said, uh, did. Um, the other thing um, which we can uh, touch upon was obviously uh, a desire to help e-commerce uh, move forward faster. And there you need Visa, MasterCard doing a better job, which we can discuss if we have time. But uh, so Chase Pay, you know, having 100 million cards and then in thousands, hundreds of thousands of merchants, they wanted to help that uh, ecosystem uh, to be created. Uh, but then again, it's so difficult to merge the systems uh, with merchants one by one, whereas all of them actually need to work with Visa and MasterCard to accept payments. So on both sides, one was, uh, you know, the e-commerce uh, space, uh, where again, it's, it's a play by Visa Master. And, and, and uh, from the uh, payment perspective, where they could not bring any additional benefit uh, on top of uh, uh, the plastic card, um, I think that's why it, I didn't want to say fail because I think it's a wonderful experience and a Chase can afford to do that. They learned a lot from it. Probably one of the uh, uh, results was bringing cardling offers to banking app. So, um, but basically those two things um, are the ones that I could mention. It's interesting too to contrast the extent to which companies will use financial incentives to drive adoption. So if you look at the card link offers that Chase has, right, they're they're provided through a company called called Cardlytics. Um, the offers are definitely good, but they're not drastic, right? Like you can get. I, I had an offer the other day that was fifteen percent off of an uh, an auto parts store, right? Which is uh, one not incredibly compelling, especially when you consider that I don't own a car. What becomes far more compelling, which, yeah, it, it's kind of wild. Um, great people who work on the product. I'm just not sure how I got targeted with that one. Contrast this that with Apple, who did an offer or sort of a, a targeted promotion in my neighborhood, a couple miles north of here in Bucktown, if you're familiar with it, where they had gone to all the stores. This was in partnership with Discover. They had gone to all the stores worth shopping at in the neighborhood 
and paired up to have incredible offers. I'm talking you go to Burton and you get 50% off. You go to a cosmetic store and get 70% off. I mean, there wasn't an offer under 25% there, and they had covered half of the interesting stores in the neighborhood. I mean, uh, financial incentives aren't going to keep people around forever, but it's a, a decent way to get people involved, yeah. but not if it's 5%, not if it's 10%. Yeah, that is, the, it, it is the, uh, it's the crack cocaine of incentives. You, you, <laughs> yeah. I have seen, I've worked on those incentives and you see that wonderful acquisition spike. And the moment that thing goes away, usage, yep, exactly. usage evaporates. There's no, it is it is not even worth doing. Yeah, I think we've definitely seen that prove true on trying to introduce a new payment mechanism, right? Because again, if the only value is the coupon, that's the minute it goes away or the discount, the minute it goes away, there's no value anymore. Uh, where we have seen it have a little more retention is in products like the Starbucks app or others where once you establish the behavior, then you tend to stick to it if it's something you're interacting with regularly already, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if you're forcing the interaction through the incentive, it drops off. If it builds the, you know, the interaction or in a exactly. new way of something yep. you're already uh, interacting with, then it can be a little yeah. more sticky. Uh, well, two things about those um, very good remarks. So one, um, you need to have a much more comprehensive platform, and that comes to IT and 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 and, and you know reinvestment, than just carling offers. So yes, the percentage is very important, but when it comes to creating the famous word loyalty, a lot of banks and and, and merchants take um, cash back as the only way to define loyalty. But as you say, you know if I come there almost uh, every other day and spend twenty dollars anyhow. Why would I change my behavior by getting two more percent, three more percent? But if you tell me, hey, why don't you come the third time? Then I will give you 25 percent. Uh, it could become sustainable financially, but also change my behavior from second to third. And that requires a different loyalty database, a different loyalty investment. Um, so one of the things that, you know, this market really needs to understand is loyalty is not just carling offers of percentages, but it's a whole campaign and promotion and rewards infrastructure that needs to be invested. Um, then the second one, obviously, is what you mentioned, you know, the relevance of content. You know, if, if um, I just push every promotion to you uh, and, and you end up receiving a gas promotion, whereas you don't have a car, you know, you say, come on, you've got to do better than this, right? So, uh, you know, that's where the famous AI and, and machine learning come into the picture, looking at your transactions. If I don't see any gasoline purchases, why don't I send you a car uh, promotion? But if I uh, see a lot of, you know, toys and, and school stuff, then I send you other children promotions. So um, then we need to create the relevancy of those promotions. So, so therefore, it's easier to speak about those loyalty and customer engagement tools, but they require a lot of investment, and, and a lot of issuers don't have that infrastructure. Um, that's one of the you know, gaps, I guess. So I'll, I'll solve this mystery for you, and then we'll take questions. Uh, I used to work at a, at a bank that also leveraged Carlytics. Carlytics has two types of offers. They have program level offers, which every Carlytics customer gets. So they go negotiate the offer with you know, AutoZone or whoever, everyone gets them. Uh, and then they have issuer specific offers that the issuers go and sell. Like, so the, the chase in this example sells McDonald's on this offer campaign. And then those get targeted based off transactions, but the sort of super program offers aren't targeted at all. So there you go. Yeah. Um, all right. Any questions? Yep. Oh, just stand up and yell. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm generally irrelevant. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off with that. But I will say that I uh, bank with an Australian bank and they have an issuer mobile wallet. And I, I run a business and I have a bunch of accounts through which I run various different bits and pieces through. And genuinely, I couldn't live without it. It, it is so flexible. It is so um, capable of solving every 
kind of payment need from the gas company to the plumber to my daughter, instant cash, etc., etc. So this is not an advertisement for Australian banks because they're no friends of mine. But my question is, what is it about America that that, that hasn't caught? I think this occurs in the UK and Europe as well. Why has this not... I do not understand why this does not work in the US. The yeah. chase thing should have worked, right? I'm, yeah. I'm with Mehmet here on this. Yeah. Um, now, knowing a little bit also you're a part of the world, welcome to Chicago, by the way. Um, so, yes, the big banks outside of the United States, uh, there are a couple of things peculiar to the, to the US market. One, the big banks, like your bank, um, have issuing and acquiring... Um, usually in the same market. They control the POSs. And they also um, cooperate a lot on the infrastructure. So the EMV, for instance, uh, migration, uh, in all the other countries except US have been much more successful than earlier because banks could come together here due to competitive pressures plus uh, you know, regulatory uh, pressures. Banks didn't do that, which we ended up without PIN, for instance. That's another uh, discussion, but that's one of the outcomes. So the banks don't come together as much as the other banks uh, around the world. Um, big banks control a big portion of the market. Here, you have about 5,600 banks which issue Visa MasterCard. Although we only know the big names, but if you look at the credit unions and community banks, they do issue and acquire, um, well, they issue mostly and acquire, but they have their own closed, captured audiences. And the other thing is the fragmentation in terms of processing. Um, almost all banks in this market use processors. And when you are a regional bank, not even small, regional bank, you're at the mercy of the processor for the delivery of the services in terms of cost, but also in timing. So there is much more fragmentation uh, and dependency between the players um, and lack of inter uh, cooperation between the banks. That's what I would say. I mean, it ext extends into the other products you mentioned too, like bill pay, right? The bill pay directories in the U.S. Yeah. are controlled by vendors. They're not easy to integrate to. You can't just plug into them in the same way. Uh, you know, P2P, different players, again, some that work together, some that don't. So the complexity in the ecosystem means it's a lot harder to align all the parts needed at scale to make something like that work ubiquitously. Yeah. So. I'm talking about Apple Pay, by the way. I think Australia was still not allowing Apple Pay to come. Hmm. Uh, they, they conceded eventually. Eventually. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, you, mentioned the, uh, you mentioned some of the difficulty in dealing with. Uh, no, we hear you. Okay. Yeah, it works. Sorry. Far enough with some speakers, I can't tell the difference. Um, the difference between uh, having a Uber app like uh, like Ten Ten Cent or or an Ali Pay system in, in China versus what the typical experience is. Uh, in North America or Europe. Um, I'm interested to know what your take is on the regulatory environment differences between the two kind of ecosystems. In one case, you've got an environment where tracking of every single thing you do is not really an issue, either for the government or for most of the people. Um, but in a lot of other markets, I mean, even some of the stuff you talked about, about having intelligent um, spending habit uh, analysis to be able to target ads, a lot of that's not really allowed in a lot of cases. That's That's got deep privacy concerns about my spending habits, where I shop, what, I, what I'm doing with my money, and frankly, turns a lot of people off of digital payments. Well, I mean, I'll... I'll I'll jump in first. I think your point is is exactly right. And I think that is the constraint that a lot of issuers feel um, in terms of opening up to non-financial services or, or more commercial services 
where are the boundaries and we are, we're, we're having the regulations um, uh, come up uh, and having to deal with the compliance around uh, the California regulations, around the European regulations. So I don't think we're exempted from that. Um, but it is a area of concern. How do you use that transactional data? Um, where are the boundaries within open banking? Where are the boundaries within how that data could be inferred through artificial intelligence? You know, there's certain models that will serve a wonderful ad based on certain attributes that you infer from transactions. Downstream, however, that raises a privacy risk because that inference could then be acted upon in a way that um, uh, is not allowed. So I, I, I think your point is correct, and I may be misinterpreting what you're saying, but I don't think, I think that might, that is one of the constraints that the issuers feel in terms of trying to bring together all of these services. Uh, they have to navigate a, a, uh, a huge number of uh, potential potholes. All right, so with that, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, thank you all for your conversation today, and thank you all.